Hello and welcome to another episode of the Artistry of Code podcast. Your hosts for today are Grzegorz Godlewski and Marek Ivanovich. And just in case you're wondering, Arthur didn't leave the podcast. Fortunately, he has better things to do, which is taking care of his family after their newborn child came to our world. So we once again send our congratulations. And in today's episode, we are going to talk about building background jobs, uh, processors or workers. As usual, sharing our you know like experiences and pro tips which we had on the uh, subject. And obviously, we are going to also cover some available implementation options. So without further ado, let's start. Welcome to the Artistry of Code podcast, where we, together with our guests, are seeking ways of doing things right and having fun with it. Software, architecture, soft skills, teamwork, and other crazy buzzwords. Are you ready? Let's bring more value to the business. So the first question for today is how we can identify and design background jobs. So I'm going to play, you know, the, the curious one and Marek is going to play the expert. So Marek, uh, how just, do you just play <laughs> an expert? <laughs> <laughs> how do you identify and design background jobs? I think that the, the most important thing to start with is uh, thinking about um, our business use case uh, and thinking about uh, the business processes we are dealing with and try to identify the stuff and like categorize it into the fourth categories which we uh, discovered while preparing this um, episode um, and we believe that uh, there we can we can group uh, them in four uh, things so the first one is stuff which has to happen like immediately and has to be immediately consistent for some reasons so uh, you can go to the <laughs> back to the episode about eventual consistency to uh, listen a bit uh, more about eventual uh, consistency the other thing is um, the stuff which can be which has to be processed soon but not really Im immediately if it happens now or it, if it happens in few minutes that's perfectly fine if the processor will run quickly it will uh, happen in seconds if if we don't have like big machine to 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 handle these jobs uh, it will happen in a few minutes but it's perfectly fine for the business yeah? for the great example of this kind of stuff to me is any sort of notifications so if 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 someone posted something and users uh, interested are notified in a minute or even 10 minutes it's perfectly fine. That's uh, that's not a biggie. This kind of delay for for the notifications. Yeah? The third category is something which has to happen within certain delay. Yeah. So uh, let's say we have the, the system where the user uh, registers, and for the safety reasons, we don't want to allow this uh, any uh, new user to upload the files. Yeah? For just for safety, and they have to wait a week. So this is quite a long to, to set timeout <laughs> in JavaScript and <laughs> just uh, believe that, uh, that it will happen without any issues yeah? because the, po the, the instance can, can be killed, can, be, can die for uh, some reason, uh, for us unhandled promise or something. And yeah, we want to schedule something to happen in certain, with certain delay yeah? or at least like some delay. And the fourth category, I think this is... Uh, about every kind of repeatable jobs yeah so uh, we often have to do something every day every hour every week maybe monthly yeah for the accounting services or any sort of financing stuff we would do a lot of stuff mo on monthly basis yeah or because it's like typical invoicing or slash accounting periods so, yeah so so that's the first step to like determine what has to ha happen now or later <laughs> in general. Yeah, so that's a very nice categorization. Um, I also like use this model to to somehow, you know, like catalog the, the jobs uh, when I'm trying to figure out the implementation, the way of how to implement that. But then again, for me, the question before is, 
well, how to identify those jobs. And you, you've provided some examples like, like with the notifications or the housekeeping tasks, right? So you run a cron job just to, let's say, clean up the trash cans of the users in the, in the application from some uh, after 30 days. So if there, an item is there for 30 days, it gets deleted like your mail on Gmail for an instance. But the step before is about to, um, you know, like identifying this. And what helps me a lot is a little bit of business analysis. So what I tend to do is uh, if there's a piece of functionality to be covered and I need to identify what kind of tasks or steps are in that process, I'm frequently going for uh, like a uh, BPMN diagram when I'm pointing out what's the um, like the entry point to the process, what are the steps in the process, what are the, you know, like escalation points. So w when there's an error in that task, what happens afterwards, stuff like that. So essentially you're starting from a drawing. And when you're going to draw that, you will see that single rectangle over there is representing a piece of functionality, piece of a process a step in that process, which has some defined boundaries, right? So for instance, if that's um, like, um, I don't know, post um, a cart or like continue to the order from your e-commerce application, you probably have this as a single step, which is pretty much self-contained transactional wise. And you don't want to, you know, like do any background stuff around this. But then again, if in your business, there's something going on with those cards. For, so for an instance, one of the examples which I have from, uh, from the e-commerce context is that companies tend to implement that asynchronous process of collecting abandoned carts. So if you had customers who were putting in into the, the cart and they didn't finalize that cart, there's a background job running through those abandoned carts and then posting uh, mails to people saying, hey, you forgot your cart from the middle of the mall. So you have to go back to the e-commerce store and do something about that. Obviously, you know, that's just like a technique to uh, increase the overall sales on, on, on the process. But then again, you can see based on that example, what's a good candidate for a background job? Then you just need to ask the questions, how often this should be running? How far from the time when this was abandoned eventually, right? Um, so th this is the place where I'm switching to these categories, which um, uh, Marek, you covered here. I believe there is also uh, another step uh, in the identifications before choosing the, the right solution, which is asking ourselves uh, and also the, the product slash business people, how critical to the business these jobs are. Yeah? So depends on uh, wh which wh one of these four categories uh, these tasks belongs to. We also have to, to then divide them to the really critical or not critical, and then decide uh, on the right uh, tooling to choose uh, for this job. And when it comes to, you know, like dealing with the critical task and ensuring that things are going to work fine, what really comes in handy, but it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, is implementing the transactional outbox pattern. So this is something very frequently like visible around microservices. What's the idea? I'm just going to shortly describe this. The idea is that whenever you're handling like an operation, which is going to, at the end of the process, result with a notification for a different component, like there's a service A doing handling the transaction, but part of it is going to, to be, let's use the example with the notifications, right? So you're going to post a message on a board and then all the watchers of that board should get that notification, right? You don't necessarily want to notify everybody uh, during that call. So you're going to delegate this to a background job, but then again, you would like to ensure that task is going to be carried out. So uh, the idea with the transactional outbox pattern is that upon serving that uh, request of posting into, into a board, you're going to do within a database transaction, and that's very important, within a database transaction, you're going to do two inserts. One insert is going to go to the posts 
collection or table, whatever you're using underneath. But within the same transaction, you are going to create a notification record, which is then uh, going to be saved all together. This way, both of those operations have to succeed in order for the call to be considered as pro correctly processed. If the notification uh, insert fails, the post also gets reverted and the user has to retry. But this way we ensure the consistency and we kind of started the promise that the notification will be carried out. The second part of the game is that you need to have a worker which is going to take the pending notifications from the inbox. That's why we have the so that process that's an inbox, but for the posting process, it's, it is the outbox. So it's going to take the pending sends and then put them on a queue, put them on a messaging system, stuff like that, right? So the pattern calls out for separating those concerns, like insert and like scheduling a notification within the same transaction boundary and a separate process, which is going to actually issue that notification outside to the to the other service. Uh, we will link the description to that pattern in the show notes so that you can do some uh, research and reading on that on your own. I think this is a great example because we can see that uh, within uh, one task, which which has to happen eventually, a bit later, but has to happen for sure, we, we are already coming across another thing which has to happen every period of time yeah because this is about the publisher then uh, so so it's always just it, it's a really interesting uh, mixture of of uh, different type of jobs working together to achieve the the business goal yes yeah? so, so it's it's really a nice example i think mm -hmm. and the other question which we have prepared for today is dealing with state in the background jobs. So as we have stateful and stateless services, stateful, stateless requests, the same goes for the background jobs and the jobs themselves. So uh, starting, Marek, again from you, what's your take on, on state in background jobs? How do you deal with that? How do you approach that? I think we can, again, stick to, to this uh, publisher uh, process here, uh, because I think this is the perfect uh, example of, of the a background job which can and most likely should be stateless because it it really doesn't need to know what happened in the past it just every every run uh, it starts it just has has to read the the the, the messages in the uh, outbox from the database and publish them that's it that that's nothing more is important yeah it's it's super critical job for the business but but the job itself is like that simple, yeah. So, so that's a really good example of of a stateless job, yeah. But even if we keep talking all, all the, as the community that everything should be stateless and everything, yeah, it's not possible really because the state is often required for some processing. And I have two examples uh, in my mind for for uh, the case when the state is required. And the, the, the first one is uh, quite often used uh, in some tutorials uh, on cloud providers or anywhere else. And it's about the like long running business processes with some uh, manual interactions. Yeah. So that against typical example of uh, document approval or holidays approval. Yeah. We don't want to like do it like uh, with the processor, which will run every minute and check if uh, for the whole database, <laughs> if the uh, for the requests which are not uh, yet uh, approved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's, it's costly, and we don't want to overload the database. Eh? So we will run the, some some sort of long running process uh, with some proper tooling, which I think we will go discuss uh, later on, and keep the state of the given workflow, yeah, of the given user uh, holiday request. Uh, approval workflow, let's say, yeah, for uh, in this case. But the other one is not really that obvious, and uh, this is the, the one which I came uh, really recently at my work, and it's about like the, the long running uh, pro data processing when we need to know them how far 
are we with this processing? Yeah, if if we have like thousands or maybe millions of records to process, so we want to do something for every user every day, yeah? and that this process fails at some point yeah? because I don't know we got the database outage or, or anything, yeah? and the processing dies. When we have one million users, do we want to start again from the first one when we already really processed uh, half of them or uh, again query the database and check the timestamps, blah, blah, blah. This is not really maintainable and scalable. Yeah, we want to somehow store the, the state and the progress. Let's say in this case, the state will be the progress of the processing in some way in, in within this worker flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the batched jobs uh, examples are always super tricky, especially if you have like a big user base uh, uh, and you like to run these kind of jobs on, on an interval. The question is always whether the whole thing has to complete within a certain time window. What I can imagine, that's actually a wild idea. I, I never did that. I'm just uh, just, you know, like putting this out from the top of my head. Is that I what I would try just out of curiosity was would be implementing uh, that scheduler which you, which you've mentioned uh, in a way that it's obviously it's going to take a look on those users but then again it's going to create a separate um, processing task per user for uh, let's say on a RobertMQ queue right so you would create uh, like a, a standalone task pro for processing of that user. Right, so you, that user's data. So the nice addition here is that automatically you can have like a Grafana chart showing you how much of the users are left for processing because they are going off the queue uh, over there. Yeah, and I, I have to say that this is, uh, in, in my opinion, and it's a really good approach uh, with splitting this kind of processing uh into like two steps yeah so one the one one job which is uh, running periodically let's say every day which has just uh, one responsibility but like super important to put the the order to, for this job on the queue yeah as you said like for for every user it will create a, a message on rabbit mq let's for this example and this will this job will be stateful yeah because it has to know mm -hmm. uh, where it ends uh, and everything while the the processing of this the given user will be stateless because it just have to do something for this given user if it fails at some stage of this processing it doesn't really matter the message will be redelivered and and uh, it will be retried yeah because yeah. we obviously we always do our system in idempotent way, so it won't have any issue there. Yeah. yeah. The essential point here, what I would just quickly jump in is that you definitely you should separate scheduling from processing, right? So you don't schedule processing in terms of like a single unit. You have like a scheduler process and the worker doing the job separate, right? So. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, because it, it, in this way, it's really maintainable. While with mm -hmm. other way around, like uh, getting everything in a single place, like so you you register the user and then you schedule the repeatable job for this user. Yeah? So so then you have to like uh, take care of removing this job when the user leaves. So you have to like adjust these jobs uh, if maybe payload changes. So you have to like update million of jobs <laughs> in some way. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really good advice here. Yeah, to like to keep the scheduling from processing uh, separate. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to me and you know like dealing with the state, I essentially uh, go with the practice where I'm avoiding state only if possible so if i'm having like a workflow which is requiring multiple steps and there's a piece of state information which have to be passed i would rather go with a pattern called uh, event carried uh, state transfer or uh, let me just fix the name yeah that's the event carried state transfer um essentially martin fowler put out like an article in 2017. We're going to link this article. It's called, what do you mean by event driven? And the event carried state transfer pattern is covered there um, in detail. In short, the idea is that when you are designing a multi-step 
background process. You can identify distinct steps in that process and then implement worker for that particular step. And now when I'm having like a event coming in for that worker, that event should contain all the necessary information for that worker to do the job so that that worker can do the job and then put out again a self-contained event with all the state in it for the second step. If you do it good, you may not even need a database <laughs> to persist that intermediate state, but this requires a different approach to the design. Now, I'm not saying that's a golden, uh, like a silver bullet here. Definitely nothing in IT is a silver bullet. This has some trade-offs and this might not be applicable to all business contexts. Some of those task my, tasks might require like a database write or a state persistence. Definitely, if, if if you go somewhere around money and you know like revenue, definitely you would have to save state on each and every step so that nothing is you know like lost. But uh, I'm trying to, like I said, I'm trying to avoid state in background jobs as much as possible, to the extent where this is really necessary by the business that the changes are persistent. Yeah, I think this is really good advice to to like, avoid the state as uh, long as possible, but uh, not really be afraid of the having some state when it's really required for the business because it can be and it will be required from time to time. And regarding the the silver bullet or golden hammer, depends if you you are fighting with the vampires or not. This is always about choosing the right tool for the given job. Yeah, so so there is. N- any perfect solution in the world to solve every problem. Yeah? And this is the, the last part of the, this episode when we want to tell you about uh, the tooling we've used uh, or we are using, and we believe uh, it can be the good thing uh, for given jobs. And the first one which I want to mention, and I started using it pretty recently, is uh, Bool. Bool.js or Bool MQ recently that the latest build is called Bool MQ, which is completely in TypeScript and it's a bit rewritten compared to the older ones, which comes with a separate package, but there it is available the Bool board, uh, which is the UI. I would say it's like the visibility tool there or monitoring tool, which comes together with, uh, with this tool and it allows to, to monitor how it behaves. And what, what is Bool about? It's about using the jobs, either eventual ones or delayed ones or repeatable ones. <laughs> so it can cover you on, on these three areas and uh, using the Redis under the hood. Yeah? So if you have Redis already in your stack and you have some instance being paid, let's say, on the, on the cloud and you don't want to employ any other sort of uh, database or something it can be good 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 tool because it, it it can handle the different type of the jobs for you with redis in in pretty nice and really robust way so it will do all the retries and everything it can do like time span delays like 7 days a month or whatever you need yeah and the the visibility on this is amazing because you have this uh, integrated bullboard so you don't have to go to redis and query the database with uh, uh, the op- Redis operators, which obviously we all know on the hand here, yeah, to how to query the whole Redis database. But you have everything at glance on the on the on the board, which is just available as uh, the Express uh, handler to, to just um, attach it to your application. You've touched a very important point, which is like the visibility of this. The The reason why I used that Robin, Robin and Q example in the past was uh, that Grafana board and visualizing that queue, because it tells you that there, something is wrong about those jobs. They are not getting processed. You can set up some alerting st- on that stuff. And really a pro tip, guys, if you're sending anything into the background, just make sure that the solution you have is going to provide you a visibility or an alert when the things are not going to execute, right? Because these kind of things tend to have problems, really. Um, and most likely, they're not visible to the customers because that's a background job. They're not visible to you immediately, right? So you just need to do proper amount of logging and monitoring and alerting to ensure that this works uh, fine. Just adding up qu- quickly to the 
toolchain. Uh, once upon a time, we had a task to implement a piece of a process, uh, which was uh, very specific because of the fact that we had to deal with multiple updates coming into our system. So let's say there were multiple operations uh, done on a certain entity. Let's say that's a customer, whatever. But then again, you had like within a 30 seconds, you had a series of updates going into, uh, into that record. Now, the problem, a performance problem, which was resulting from that was that each and every update on that entity was resulting with another notification to an external system. So we kind of got the complaint that uh, we are flooding it. We were flooding the external system with the notifications within that uh, time window. So uh, in order to cope with that, the, the idea was to implement a delayed job, which is just summarizing the final like shape of that entity after that 30-second series of updates, and then sends this out. How we managed to do that? Well, when the updates were running in, we've used RabbitMQ with a delayed job plugin. So when you set this up, you're able to schedule a task to RabbitMQ, and it's not going to enter the exchange in the queue until the time which you've provided. So essentially, you can delegate the responsibility of maintaining that information about the fact that this task has to be put on the queue and then putting uh, it on the queue to the RabbitMQ, uh, RabbitMQ cluster, which you have. So I, I encourage you to at least take a look on that plugin. It might um, become handy at some point. This makes me think about the stuff I had to deal with the security in the past. So when the user entering the house uh, and you have to like sort of debounce the notification or any, any sort of triggers in case the alarm is disarmed in the meantime. Yeah, and we had to deal with the, the, a lot of state around it and to make it robust. Uh, and I think this could be a good solution for that. Uh, in this case, just to schedule a job in 30 seconds or 60 and see what's, what's happened in the meantime. Yeah, I don't remember exact solution, but yeah, it was definitely more complicated on this uh, to achieve the same robustness. The other example I want to share is uh, the tool which uh, I started using also recently, and it's Temporal, temporal.io, and it's um, it's open source tooling, but they also have like paid cloud, which helps them uh, to grow. And uh, it's about workflows. It's about like, like the more the, the stateful workflows. And uh, the, the one case uh, we are using it is to, to exactly separate the scheduling process from the processors with the state uh, for uh, not processing something like twice uh, or at least minimizing the number of, of the entities being processed twice. Yeah? So, so it has this amazing uh, functionality of the heartbeat where the heartbeat is not only telling the, 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 the orchestrator or, or the worker that it is alive, but it, the heartbeat can also uh, carry the data. So, so with uh, every uh, heartbeat, you tell the, the orchestrator, hey, I'm at uh, this cursor, for example. Yeah? And then the next few seconds, uh, you tell that you are there and there and there. And in case the processing dies, for some reason, when it starts again, it gets the, the last heartbeat data injected. So you can f uh, pick up uh, where you left before the process has been killed. And I think we can't finish this episode without saying, Marek, that when you're designing your jobs, make sure that the intent potency is there so that yeah. restarting jobs uh, and uh, putting up the same task again in the processing pipeline. Uh, it's not going to make more garbage that uh, it's there already. Yeah, really, this this episode couldn't go out without s at least mentioning this. Um, unfortunately, looking at the time, we should be slowly getting to the closure here. So just to wrap it, wrap it up, guys, we would like to know how do you guys build uh, your background jobs? Any pro tips, any patterns which you utilize? Make sure you let us know on, on the Facebook comment section. You can let us know on the uh, YouTube comment section. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. You can also like our fan pages on Facebook. We're also on LinkedIn. So share your love. Join us on the little community which we're trying to build up here. That's it for today. So it's time to say goodbye. Goodbye. 
that's all for today. Thanks for spending your time with us. Visit our page on Facebook and Twitter, leave us a comment under the episode, subscribe to the updates and share it with others. We would like to hear your feedback so that we can prepare more interesting content for you to enjoy. Hear you next time! Bye.